Well, I actually attend pre-COVID in particular, a Wednesday night dinner once a month with um, about eight guys, most of whom are medicos like myself or dentists. And we're all children of Holocaust survivors. And we've known each other, you know, in the vicinity of 50, 60 years, you know what I mean? And um, one of the guys at the meeting uh, asked the rest of us, have we ever heard of John Henry Patterson? And only one person at the meeting had heard of him. And uh, he said that he'd just read Ernest Hemingway's story, The Short Happy Life of Francis Macomber. And at the end of the story, there was a footnote to say that Hemingway based this story on real life events in the life of John Henry Patterson, who led Jewish legions at Gallipoli and in Palestine during World War I. And uh, I was shocked that I'd never heard of him because uh, number one, I was born in Australia. I was fully educated here. I was used to, from the first year at school, being told that Anzac Day is the most important commemoration in the Australian calendar. And uh, nobody had ever mentioned to me that there were Jewish soldiers at Gallipoli and there were Jewish soldiers in Palestine accompanying this Anzac light horseman. Um, so um, uh, the person at the group who had heard of him mentioned that Patterson had in fact written memoirs and uh, he wrote a memoir called With the Zionists at Gallipoli, which was published in 1916, one of the earliest memoirs of Gallipoli ever. And then he'd written another memoir with the Judeans in the Palestine campaign in 1922. And um, when I got home that evening, I'm often on a book site, I don't know if you ever use it, called Adol, looking for rare books. And so I, I tuned into it and I found one copy of each book available in the world and I immediately bought them. And uh, when they came, I read them and uh, they really disturbed me um, because um, I felt that there was such a lack of justice in this world that I'd never heard of this man who is one of the true heroes of the Jewish people and a person that I hold in as much respect now as people like Moshe Dayan and Yitzhak Rabin. I don't regard him as any less than them. And um, because of that, I really felt determined to write a book. Uh, there had been two books written about him in the 20th century, but they weren't uh, they were more comprehensive with other aspects of his life and not specifically with the Jewish side of things. And I felt something had to be written to make him a Jewish hero in exactly the same capacity he was prior to his death in 1947. So that's really how the book came about. Look, I, I think that's an excellent question, but I think before we get right into it, we have to say that Patterson's been written out of history by several sources. Uh, he was first written out by, of history by General Allenby. And it's important to realize that Allenby was an Arabist. He was an anti-Semite. He was an anti-Zionist. He wanted the Balfour Declaration overturned and he wanted an Arab Islamic state in Palestine. So that's his reason. Uh, the way he did it was he allowed the American filmmaker, Lowell Thomas, to make a movie during the war, which was titled With Allenby in Palestine and With Lawrence in Arabia. And that movie in the aftermath of the war was shown to millions of people in New York, London, and I think also in a couple of other European cities, millions of people. It made Allen be the pinup general, pinup boy general of World War I, as far as the British Army was concerned. And it created Lawrence 
into an incredible legend and cult figure based on a story that is 90% fiction. Most of the Lawrence story isn't even factual. Um, and Lawrence actually confessed this to a Colonel Richard Meinertzhagen, who appears in the book, but Meinertzhagen didn't release that information till about 40 years later when he published his own military diaries. So that was the Allenby camouflaging, uh, using the film by Lowell Thomas to camouflage the story of Patterson and sweep it under the carpet of history. Um, he was written out of Australian military history by the journalists Bean and Gullet, uh, who were responsible for the Gallipoli and the Palestine chapters. Uh, I don't want to comment on Gullet, but Bean was well known to be anti-Semitic and a great opponent of Sir John Monash. And um, uh, the few statements that appear in those volumes tend to be derogatory as regards Patterson and his troops. And, and there are only a couple of sentences. Uh, in the case um, of Gallipoli, they were totally contradictory to what was published by the British War Office in London in 1916. And in the case of Gullet, totally contradictory to what General Chater of the Anzac Light Horsemen published in 1920 or wrote in 1920. Uh, so he was written out of Australian history. And then he was written out of Jewish history. And this may shock you by David Ben-Gurion. And the reason David Ben-Gurion wrote him out of history was because David Ben-Gurion uh, hated Vladimir Jabotinsky, the other Zionist, with an intense passion and he was doing his best to camouflage Jabotinsky out of Israeli history. Uh, and he couldn't do that without camouflaging Patterson. And um, Ben-Gurion hated Jabotinsky to such an extent, and I didn't know these things till I started writing the book, that at a meeting in Tel Aviv, I think in 1933 or 1934, he referred to Jabotinsky as Vladimir Hitler. And he wrote a pamphlet shortly afterwards with a chapter entitled Jabotinsky in the Footsteps of Hitler. Um, and uh, the reason he hated him, of course, was because he was on the left side of Zionist politics and Jabotinsky was on the right side of Zionist politics. And Jabotinsky did him a tremendous favour by dying of a heart attack in 1940. And um, when he died, he left a will which stated that he wants to be buried where he dies. But when there is a Jewish state in Palestine, he wants his remains to be transferred to that Jewish state and buried there at the request of the Jewish government there. And when Ben-Gurion took office in 1948, he got a succession of requests every year to bury Jabotinsky's remains uh, in Israel. And each time he replied, no, Israel is for living people, not dead people. But as soon as he was asked in 1948, he immediately sent for Herzl's remains to be transferred from Vienna and be buried in Israel. Um, and this continued till he left office in 1963. Now, um, he had um, a temporary lapse in his prime ministership in 1954-55, when he handed over to Moishe Sharet uh, because of the Kastner trial that was taking place in Israel at the time. Ben-Gurion, the consummate politician, didn't want to be prime minister if and when Kastner was found guilty because the Mapai party was financing his trial. So he put the job on poor Charette's shoulders. Uh, in deference to Charette, he was one of the many people over the 15 years of Ben-Gurion's reign who requested Jabotinsky be allowed to be buried there. And so was Yitzhak Ben-Svi, 
the president of Israel, the longest serving president, and uh, the president who was there during most of Ben-Gurion's reign. And it wasn't until Eshkol, also of the Mapai party, became prime minister in 1963, that um, a request was successful and Jabotinsky's remains were buried in Israel in 1964. Now, um, Patterson, when he led the Jewish forces in Palestine, they were classified initially as the 38th, 39th and 40th Royal Fusiliers, even though they had been officially designated uh, Jewish legions by the War Office, Allenby withheld that title from them for as long as he could. And um, Jabotinsky was with Patterson in the 38th Battalion. Uh, Ben-Gurion was in the 39th Battalion. Um, but when Ben-Gurion arrived in Cairo, he got a severe attack of dysentery and he was hospitalised. By the time he recovered sufficiently to rejoin the columns, uh, the fighting was already over. The 39th had gone to Palestine and took place in the fighting and Ben-Gurion was shunted out of hospital into the 40th, which didn't arrive till the fighting was over. And uh, if you read Patterson's memoirs of the Palestine campaign, you can't go about three pages without seeing the name Jabotinsky. The name Ben-Gurion doesn't appear in the memoirs at all. And if someone like Ben-Gurion was going to make Patterson famous and make his memoir famous and read by Israelis, why is it that Jabotinsky appears on nearly every page and he doesn't appear at all? Um, so that's, that's the real story. Uh, Patterson also left a will to say that he wanted to be buried in a Jewish cemetery, in a Jewish state in Palestine. Uh, preferably a cemetery where a number of the people who served under him were also buried. And um, a request was finally made in about 2013 by his grandson. His son obviously wasn't interested in it, but his grandson was. And he was buried in Israel in 2015 at a place called Avihail, which is a moshav, just outside of Netanya, which was formed after World War I by quite a number of soldiers who served under him. Um, they were all buried in their own cemetery there, and he was buried with them. They've now established since then a museum at Avihail for Patterson and his men. And there's also been a Friends of Zion Museum for the last few years, from about 2015, in Jerusalem, which was founded by Christian Zionists, uh, where Patterson is also prominently featured. Um, so he's starting now to get some recognition. And I actually saw a news feature a couple of weeks ago where Tzvi Hauser, who's either a current or ex-member of the Knesset, was proposing that a new Israeli defence facility be named the Patterson facility, because Patterson is now recognised as the godfather of the Israeli army. Ben-Gurion helped draw attention away from Patterson by claiming that Wingate was the godfather of the Israeli army. And Wingate, of, of course, was associated with a young Dayan and a young Rabin. But what he really did was teach them how to conduct night raids against Arab marauders before the Arabs attacked them. It was not a disciplined army. What, what Patterson actually contributed to the picture was these Jewish troops served in a highly disciplined army. Well, to do that, you have to understand the conditions under which he took over the Jewish troops. Um, in 1908, he was a decorated and highly distinguished British soldier, and he was doing exploratory work in Africa for the Brits. 
and uh, he was allowed to conduct uh, lion safaris on the side. And uh, one of these lion safaris uh, was joined by the son of an English lord and his wife, who I think was a daughter of one of the founders of ICI from memory, so real British upper crust. And um, in the course of the safari, um, it is alleged, and it's probably true, um, well, it's known that the husband committed suicide and the wife had an affair with Patterson, this is the thing. And uh, Patterson, as a result of this, was drummed out of the British Army. And um, when World War I started, he felt that he should offer his services again. So he went to the war office and um, he requested that he serve and they told him to get lost. He then took himself to France at his own expense and was told to get lost and go home to Britain. And then he realised that one of his old mates from the old army days was in Cairo. So he took himself out once again at his own expense to Cairo and um, he asked this chap for a job and the job he was given was the job that no other English soldier wanted to undertake and that was to train a group of young Russian Zionists mainly who had been expelled from Palestine by the Turks into a Jewish mule train for Gallipoli and he had three weeks in order to do it. And uh, they said he had to concentrate on them as a mule train, not as a fighting force. But in three weeks, he trained them into a formidable mule train and fighting force. He took them to Gallipoli. And after being there with them for a number of weeks, he came to the conclusion that these men who were serving under him were the bravest and most intelligent soldiers who had ever served under him in the British Army. And as a result of that, he took on their Zionist ideals and became probably even a bigger Zionist than they were. And the rest of his life was devoted to Zionism, even after the war ended. And uh, so much so that Jabotinsky actually described him as one of the most significant Christian people our nation has been exposed to in all the years from the dispersion in 138, 135 AD until to the current day. Yeah, well, um, it did. The answer is simply it did. Um, what I actually did was on the chapters in the um, First and Second World War, or those particular chapters of his life, I actually edited his books. And so I actually have you speaking to the reader. Uh, he's, Patterson is speaking to the reader in the first person. It's like he's talking to you. It was a technique I used for a previous book I wrote called The Five Walking Sticks many years ago. And um, when you use that technique, you, the reader really gets sucked in. Um, and you feel this man is talking to you. And he's such a determined opponent of anti-Semitism that you just can't help yourself, you know. Um, and... Uh, he, um, he fights it at every stage. He fights the people uh, who are his superiors and Allenby's deputies. Uh, he won't stand for it for one second. It's just, it's just vehement uh, that you suddenly feel that look at the world today. You know, anti-Semitism is rife. Um, you've got the United Nations you know, Human Relations Committee is vehemently anti-Semite. The International Criminal Court has become vehemently anti-Semite. Uh, Corbyn was terribly anti-Semitic in London. And I sort of felt a need when I finished the book to let Patterson talk about the current situation. 
and that involved um, a history literally from at the end of World War I right up to the current day. Well, look, I want to start the answer to that question by saying that Patterson loved the Anzacs. He said they were the only group that he met that weren't anti-Semitic. And he said not only were they the most courageous fighters there, they were the most decent human beings there. And uh, if you actually look at the cover of the book, uh, there are five photographs here yeah, on the cover of the book. You've got Joseph Trumpeldor and Jabotinsky at the top. The two figures at the bottom are Eliezer Margolin and uh, Rabbi Falk. Now, there's a strong Australian connection there because Margolin emigrated from Russia to Australia in the 19th century. He joined the Anzacs at the start of World War I. He served with the Anzacs at Gallipoli, and after Gallipoli, he transferred to Patterson's forces and uh, was in charge of the 39th Division when Patterson wasn't there. He was uh, not in charge when they were together, but when Patterson wasn't there, he was in charge. Falk was so impressed by the Australians that he actually emigrated to Sydney after World War I, also Russian-born became a rabbi at the Great Synagogue in Sydney and was very prominently sought every year to deliver speeches on Anzac Day. So those two guys have an incredibly strong Australian connection. Um, the, other, the current organisations that I've, I've approached have shown an interest, but uh, I suppose uh, they haven't got the bubbling enthusiasm that I have for Patterson. Do you know what I mean? So um, I'm hoping that um, he'll be written up in a couple of military journals. And I'm hoping that one day there might be a poster on a wall somewhere in the War Memorial in Canberra, um, eliciting his connection with the Australians. One of the most interesting ones was, uh, I think they were at Lemnos from memory, just before they embarked for Gallipoli. And um, there'd been terrible storms and ships were run aground. And Patterson um, had to transfer all his troops and all his mules from one ship to another. And while they were in the process of doing that, they were using all the necessary facilities. There were no others. And a Captain Edmonds came up to him from the Anzacs and said that um, they'd had to change ships as well. And um, the problem that he was suffering was that his medical supplies were all on the other ship. And would Patterson be interested in just leaving his mission for a while until he loaded all the medical supplies onto the Anzac ships so that when they landed at Gallipoli, they'd have medical supplies. And Patterson did that. And then after he'd spent, you know, quite a number of hours doing that, he went back to it. His men went back. His soldiers actually loaded the supplies. And um, then he went back and loaded his own boat. Uh, and uh, a, a couple of months later, he got a letter from Edmund saying that if he hadn't have done that, the landing at Gallipoli would have been incredibly disastrous. So there is a strong Australian connection, yeah.